perfect. So as Alex has already introduced, uh, the idea is to give you just a quick update over what has happened over the past year. Some of the things that we're also planning in the future, so you're a bit aware of where we're, where we're headed. Uh, if you've been closely following the development of MISP and you're playing with all the new features whenever we do a release, a lot of this will be redundant to you. But hopefully, we, even if you do that, you still miss some of the things that we've released. So we're going to focus a little bit uh, at, uh, on the highlights of the last year. So uh, basically, the idea is, uh, even though we only had a virtual MISP summit last year, we did a similar recap there. So the idea is to, to really just see what happened in between. So first of all, a little bit about the development itself since last year, what, uh, what has happened in terms of some numbers. So we've had a total of 16 releases. We've kind of dialed that down that really frequent update that we used to do a few years ago where we were doing releases every other week or every week sometimes. We got a lot of negative feedback about how annoying that was. <laughs> so we're trying to consolidate uh, releases and unless there is something urgent to fix, we try to stick to a monthly cadence on releases. In terms of commits, we had 3,768 commits, as you can see. So this is mostly what I'm going to be talking about is the core software of MISP. So not so much the MISP ecosystem in terms of taxonomies and all the other supporting libraries. So obviously, if you count those, then there were even more. We had I was a bit surprised by the number as, uh, as well. Exactly 100 contributors in that one year. Uh, so it's not a made up number. <laughs> I ran my script and it really threw 100 back <laughs> as a result. Uh, so that's how many people have contributed over the past year. It could be one commit. It could be as much as I think the highest number, uh, number of commits from a single person was 900. Uh, shout out to Jakub Wanderka for <laughs> being an absolute monster when it comes to commits. Uh, now, in terms of uh, of the new features that popped up, if we dive straight into that, um, I've kind of split it into three categories of how uh, of how we're going to be talking about them now. First of all, the internals. What has changed internally in MISP? These are very often not very visible changes, but often changes that really affect how MISP functions in general. So very often, from a user perspective, all you will notice is things are faster or things work as they should have always, but you never you never know that it wasn't working correctly. Um, also, uh, we've had quite a few improvements to the core functionalities of MISP. So those are the functionalities that you've already been using, so they have been enhanced in one way or another, as well as we're going to be looking at some of the integrations and security changes that have come up with MISP. So looking at the internal soups, that was a bit weird. Uh, we have a continuous work that has been ongoing for a long time, and we've, been, we've talked about this last year as well. We've been refactoring a lot of the internals of the code base in order to prepare MISP for a uh, tax stack uh, switch. So we've been, uh, we have another project that uh, is going to have a, a presentation tomorrow, so you're all welcome to uh, listen on that one too. Uh, we have a, uh, this tool called Cerebret, which is a community management uh, tool that sits side by side with MISP. And we've been using that as kind of also a testing ground for the new tech stack. So we've already built that with the stack that we, ha we have in mind for MISP. A lot of the code base that we use there is, uh, is ported from MISP directly. So we, we're preparing the move this way that we're, we're moving libraries from MISP over. We're moving functionalities from MISP over to make our own lives easier as well. So there was a lot of focus on that. Uh, we've also had a lot of uh, work uh, in terms of fixing issues that we've been having as well as, uh, uh, as working a lot with integration. So we're going to dive into some of those topics in a little bit more uh, detail of what changed there, uh, as well as a lot of documentation. One of the shortcomings that we've had with MISP for a very long time, especially if you are working with, with the API or if you're integrating with MISP, uh, was that those things are, were very ad hoc and you had to check the code very often to see how they worked. Now, uh, we've had quite a bit of rework there as well. So um, we have Luciano here in the audience too, who was doing an insane amount of work on, uh, on the documentation as well uh, and, and to make the API more usable. Uh, so we're going to look at that as well a bit. So uh, talking about Luciano, another thing that he was doing over the uh, past year was he wrote a completely new uh, background processing system. If you've been running MISP for the past few years, you're probably using the old uh, background processing system uh, based on a framework called KRESC, uh, which is horribly outdated and not, not really maintained anymore. 
Uh, and also it's an utter, utter nightmare to debug as it's layer upon layer of abstraction of different libraries, so it's really a pain to use. Now there is a new uh, uh, library in place, uh, thanks to Luciano, uh, that you can use as it's based on Supervisor D. It's very lightweight. It cuts out all the stuff that we don't actually use from Kcrest. So from Kcrest gets a huge code base for something that we don't need. So this is much easier to debug as well. Uh, it is much closer to how the o how your OS would uh, would schedule jobs rather than uh, shoehorning uh, this into another system. Um, and basically, uh, first and foremost, it's compatible with the old one. So it's a drop-in replacement for the old system. Uh, so that means that you can simply follow the install guide for it. Uh, so there's a blog post about it. Uh, install it and then simply switch to that one and continue using MISP as you would, uh, would have before. Now, once we do that tax switch, the old background uh, jobs will disappear. So we are not going to be supporting those uh, indefinitely. So it's a good idea to uh, think of the switch as soon as possible because it's, it's just way better to use in general. Uh, but until then, we'll be supporting both. So this message, this was the message that we've said, uh, we said when the, uh, tool came out, which was almost a year ago now, so it was late last year, um, and we're still going to support it for a while longer until we do the tax uh, stack, uh, switch. Now, something else has changed, and this is for those of you that are part or are running larger MISP communities out there, managing uh, sharing groups uh, can be incredibly tedious, especially if you have overlapping sharing groups. Imagine, for example, that you have a broad community and smaller sub-communities that are made up of members of the broader community. That means that if you have, uh, are enrolling a new member, you might have to update four or five different sharing groups to include them in all of those, even though they're basically an inheritance model that you're replicating uh, manually by creating sharing groups. Now, what we can do in the newer versions of MISP is build blueprints that are rule-based, where you can say, for example, I want to include all the financial organizations from the Benelux states. So in that case, I would take uh, country Benelux uh, or, or Belgium plus Netherlands plus Luxembourg and uh, uh, sector financial. If you have your organizations correctly filled out and populated, it will automatically create a sharing group for you that you can then keep updating with the same rules over time. You can also encapsulate other sharing groups. So you could say that I, I'm creating, for example, a European CSERT uh, sharing group that will include all the CSERTs from, say, Germany, from Luxembourg, and so on, and then it would basically uh, inherit the organizations. Now, a reason for uh, for why we have the, uh, have this in place now, and you're going to see a lot of these different new use cases that popped up recently, is we suddenly, due to the geopolitical situation that we're living through now, uh, had the need to quickly adapt groups that we were part of. That means quickly exclude organizations, quickly include new organizations. So we had a very rapid change in some of the community management that we had to accommodate. So this is really coming out of a need that quickly arose but it is something that you probably have to work with as well quite frequently. So here is an example of, of what a blueprint looks, looks like. So this is, for example, a sharing group that includes uh, the, called non-sanctioned financial organizations that includes uh, uh, any financial uh, organization on, on the community, excluding organizations from those countries that are listed. So that's just an example. So some other changes, uh, and this is again uh, going back to what we can share uh, between different communities. Uh, we had the need that, uh, to exclude certain types of information. We had this really interesting use case where someone came to us and said, a uh, military organization, that they have a more restricted network that they do a lot of analysis internally on, but they, for example, cannot transfer malware samples over to that, uh, to that instance. So they wanted to exclude any attribute that contains a malware sample which is a pretty logical request for an internal use case like that, but you had no real way of doing that before unless it went through feeds and custom tools and so on. So now you can basically configure a lot of additional rules in the synchronization and exclude data based on these different rules of what you share between these different networks. Something else that has happened uh, over the uh, past year, and this is, again, uh, it, it's visual uh, graph-related things. So obviously, it's coming from Sami, our graphman, as Alex has mentioned. Uh, so he has reworked the way we do timelining in MISP. 
one of the things that uh, that we use timelining for is to be able to visualize uh, how uh, an, an incident has evolved, for example. Now, this very often includes screenshots, it includes images, it includes a lot of moving parts that we want to be able to visualize. So one of the things that, uh, that he did was he reworked the timelines, so now we can basically show a lot uh, more directly in the graph and just look at the visual interface rather than having to rely on the uh, 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 column-based uh, representation of the data. So this is very fresh. If you, if you are, even if you're following this closely, you most likely don't know about this. It's so fresh. In fact, uh, one of the most annoying things when you're joining a MIS community is, uh, is what happens to your inbox after a few weeks. So most likely, if, you're if your community is synchronizing with other communities out there, you're going to end up with a lot of publish alerts. Now, we had quite a few annoyed users that said, please opt me out of this. I don't want to receive all these e emails. They're not useful to us. And to be honest, they're most of the time not really useful. However, you still want to be, to be, uh, to be aware of certain things popping up in your community. You still want to get metrics. And very often, you do still rely on emails. So one of the things that we have now uh, since recently is a system that allows you to create rules for creating digests. So that means daily reports of the new events that popped up or monthly reports of the, of the, of the events that popped up along with statistics and all sorts of metrics that get shared with it. So here's an example of what such an email would look like, a digest email that contains information about what sort of contextualization uh, was shared, uh, was used to share in the information that was shared. Uh, al along with what, uh, with, with metrics on the amounts of data and so on and so forth. So uh, I highly recommend that you consider to move to this model uh, in your community. Um, generally, you get much more useful. You know, we, we see a lot of, of, uh, of communities just completely disregarding the publish alerts anyway, especially once the data flow is becoming heavier. So it's not something really manageable, but this, this should work pretty well. It's configurable per user. So every user can opt into this specifically. That means they can opt out of the normal publish alerts and opt into this system instead. So it's a pretty nice quick win. Now something else, and, and this was a massive blocker for us a few months ago. Uh, you, uh, quite a few people here were probably in the same boat as us, uh, where you synchronize with other communities and someone accidentally floods your instance with highly overcorrelated data. We had some cases where someone just started throwing everything that they got in their sandboxing our way, incredibly overcorrelated data that absolutely killed our instance overnight. So I remember it was during a weekend, we came back on Monday and we noticed that our MISP was completely unusable. We simply ended up with 400 gigs or something of correlations over the weekend uh, with a single synchronization and it just totally killed us. So this prompted uh, the rework of the correlation engine. So it's a completely rewritten engine. The idea behind it it's, is uh, that we store a lot less data about the correlations themselves. So we rely more on the actual attribute data rather than storing information in correlations, as well as uh, having baked in protections against what we call overcorrelation. So it's a threshold that you can set on your instance. If something generates more than say 100 correlations, most likely isn't valuable information for you anymore. That's just noise. So you can tune this, configure this, and on ingestion of the data already protect your instance from being flooded. So highly recommend that you use it. We also started thinking more and more, and we are slowly moving in this direction. We are seeing different use cases for MISP out there, including what we call a sharing community MISP instance. That's what we at Circle run mostly. But we also have some what we call endpoint MISPs. So those are MISP instances that are either purely used for collection or purely used to field, feed tools internally. These instances have usually a single organization that has access to them. They sit on your internal network. You don't really care about ACL on these systems. So uh, burdening the users and the tools that are fetching data with all the ACL uh, computations on each data point retrieved is completely o uh, overkill for these instances. So one of the things that we did, at least with the correlation already, is we have a second mo mode in place that you can switch to that purges the entire correlation aspect from, uh, or the entire uh, distribution aspect of correlations. Everything is visible to everyone in terms of correlations on the instance. It is not something that gets synchronized anyway, so if you would share this data back, there is no harm done, since the correlations are rec recalculated on the remote instance 
if they are sharing instance, it will include the ACL. Uh, but it will save you a lot of performance and a lot of storage space if you use this internally uh, on your endpoint MISP instance. So uh, if you're in one of those cases, highly recommended to switch to this. You're going to gain even more performance than you do with just the new in uh, engine itself. Something else, uh, if you are sending out, uh, if you care about the emails that you're sending out and you are not happy with the way we did that, we had some requests, for example, to include additional information about classifications, for example, or to send uh, better styled HTML emails out instead. Uh, we had no way of really doing that. Now you can just drop new templates into a directory uh, 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 and that will be override the default building of the uh, emails and replace it with your styled emails. We currently support uh, the publish alerts as well as the password resets and enrollment messages where you can replace it with your own. Besides these, there were a bunch of other types of improvements, so quality of life improvements, performance fix fixes, and a lot of things for you to basically discover that are not that documented, but sometimes tiny things that will make your life a lot easier. One of the things, for example, that popped up like this that I, I only noticed a few versions after the fact simply because I didn't notice it, was that we, uh, you can now, for example, configure which tabs you're showing on the index per user. So that means that if there is something that you're not interested at all in there, you can absolutely hide it for your user and only populate it with the types of data that you're interested in. So there are a bunch of small changes like that. Uh, you can crawl through the change logs. It's absolutely heavy, but you will probably just find them on your own when you need it. <laughs> so a massive shout out goes to Jakub Anderka again. Uh, he's been doing an absolutely crazy work in these small changes, performance improvements, sanity checks, so a lot of cleanup of the code base as well. So it's it's really an impressive amount of work that he's done. Now in terms of integration, I already mentioned this. Uh, Luciano has been working on an open API in, uh, implementation for uh, MISP. So if you want to build tools and you want to integrate with MISP, you get information about uh, how to build those queries, what sort of payloads MISP expects, and what sort of responses you will get. So it also enumerates the types of, uh, of, me uh, of messages that you will probably be getting back from the system. So it should make it a lot easier. It replaces the old API documentation, which honestly was not great. <laughs> so, so it's a really good change. Um, so if you've already built something or are thinking of building something, have a look again at the documentation. You'll get a lot more help there. This is an example of what it looks like. So here we see an example uh, for a search query. You see all of the different parameters on the right side enumerated. Uh, and and on, in the middle, you also have descriptions for them, <laughs> as well as some sample values. And if we were to scroll down here, you would also see the different types of responses there. So it just makes your life a lot easier. Now, for workflows, I'm not going to go too deeply into it because you already heard, heard Sami talk about it. Uh, but basically, as a very quick recap, uh, the idea is that we wanted to be able to modify existing execution paths, so things that already exist in MISP, to modify it with your own behaviors, and to build interactions both within MISP and with other tools, as well as decision trees between these different uh, nodes. But we've already seen plenty about that, so I'm not going to spend time on this too much. Okay, now something else, again, I'm not going to go too deeply into this because Christian will talk about this tomorrow. He's been... Uh, at working on the sticks implementation of MISP now for several years, and it's quite a heavy amount of work. If you ever try to build something that fully maps to every corner and nook of uh, sticks, it's quite a task. <laughs> so he's been working on, on that and improving the libraries that we have. We have a, a few massive changes in the pipe. We've been working together with DHS and Mitra on this in order to, first of all, get uh, the stick support up to the latest standard as well as to correctly map to some of the things that we've somewhat mapped to before, but not correctly or not extensively enough. So we're aiming for a 100% coverage of the standard, uh, which is quite a task for Christian. Uh, we worry about his sanity, but there's that. <laughs> uh, one of the big changes is that it's now a standalone library, the, the converter between MISP and STIX. So that means that if you're using other projects, generating feeds and so on, you can directly use the library to make these conversions outside of MISP as well. So uh, that should give you uh, 
pretty good idea on on on, uh, on how to build your own tooling, your own feeds without ever looping it through MISP. There's also a lot of documentation, including examples for any type of mapping uh, between the two formats. But again, I don't want to spoil too much from Christian's talk, so I'll stop here. Just a small example. Uh, uh, Another thing that we've been integrating with, and this goes back to our own issues at Circle, which is basically we run multiple MISP instances, we're part of multiple communities. There is some overlap between them, but but one thing that is absolutely sure between all of them is managing many communities with a lot of members is a lot of work. So uh, we have uh, Sasha here sitting in the uh, audience who is dealing a lot with our communities, uh, which is, as he will attest to, way too much t <laughs> work. <laughs> So one of the things we try to do is we are building another tool as part of a European project that we're going to be talking about tomorrow that helps you with managing MISP. And we've been doing a lot of integrations also from MISP towards this tool to be able to pull information about organizations, to validate information and so on. And we're going to go much further than that in the future. Uh, but we're going to, again, talk about this more tomorrow rather than today. Something else, uh, if you've been uh, dealing with uh, a lot of emails, like we we are, uh, are at Circle in terms of our constituency sending us their spam, their malicious email, and so on, getting all of this data into MISP and making them easily searchable and actionable is tough, and it again takes work. So Sasha has built a tool called Mail to MISP that, uh, that has seen its public release over the past year. Um, we've been using it internally for quite a few years now uh, with different iterations. The idea behind the tool is it can work as a spam trap or it, it can be uh, hooked into uh, an existing uh, mail server to uh, receive emails and to directly parse and encode them based on the rules that you configure. Uh, so it's a pretty configurable tool. It's not using um, um, the built-in parsing of MIST directly, so you can additionally override it with other functionalities. Uh, so uh, we basically encode anything that our constituency sends us into a junk MISP instance, a spam collector instance, and we use that to, cr to cross-reference ongoing incidents, for example. So we use it as a knowledge base of existing emails where we can, oh, we have some information here that we've already seen from our constituency. Let's pivot over there and see what else they've shared with us. So, yeah, just something for you to check out. It's easy to configure. Uh, highly recommend it uh, to use that. We also had a bunch of new MIS modules uh, pop up over the past year. So, again, not going to go into too, uh, too much details. We've already seen uh, Robert uh, talk about uh, using hash lookup. So, this is uh, another example uh, of a, a, mod a module uh, of a new service that we're integrating with. Uh, so, if you want to be able to get more information about any hash, you can now just enable the hash lookup module and get information about that hash from any of those so uh, sources like the uh, official wh uh, whitelists from Microsoft and so on. A bunch of other modules as well. I'm not going to go too deeply into it. So it's, it's a never evolving beast and uh, there are a lot of new releases there. Now, finally, as the last pillar of, of the new features that we talked about, we had quite a few changes in the security posture of MISP. Again, uh, the past year has uh, has made us face new challenges that we haven't had to before. Um, so we had to um, to lock down some communities in terms of how they share information. Now, one of the hurdles that we've seen was uh, in MISP, uh, bad actors are kind of not accounted for in, in, in the sharing model of MISP. So that means that if you have a sharing community where you have bad faith actors in your community, tampering with, with information, for example, was a possibility through, uh, through their own MISP uh, servers. So that means that if you share with a partner on their server, they can modify the data and share it back out as your data, basically. So this was always a possibility by tampering with the data, modifying the code base, and so on. So one of the things that we did was, in order to lock down certain events that are more critical uh, from tampering, is to introduce cryptographic signing for, uh, for the information. So this does impose some limitations on the sharing. Uh, basically, the way it works is any modification for an event that you've already received can only be executed by someone that, is, that uh, has their public key listed in the event. 
So that means that if there is a modification without the proper signature coming from another instance, it will be rejected. So you can lock down who can modify an event on the instance. Now this also has a downside. Modifications can travel only as far in your network of MISPs as they are mentioned in the um, list of public keys. So if, uh, if three hops down the line, the owner of the instance has no way of signing the information with any of the vetted keys, then they cannot propagate the change further. That's a downside, but again, for, uh, when you have the critical need to protect events in a community where you suspect bad faith actors, it really helps. So here's a small example of how this works. Here we have three MISP instances. So Alice, Bob, and Eva, where Eva is the bad faith actor. They try to uh, inject uh, something in event A that was shared by Alice and then share it back out to the community. Until now, with the previous model of MISP, so the one that you're, if you're not using this new, uh, this new, what we call protected mode, would have allowed Eva to propagate the event back to Bob with the changes. But again, we had already a protection in place that protected at least the event at the source. So that means that Bob could not propagate the change back to Alice in this case, because Alice's MISP would say, hey, this is my event. I've created this. So you are not, you don't get to modify this remotely. So there we at least had some protection, but still the event would be modified and we would have the poisoned event on Bob's side. Now with a protected event, this works differently. We, in this case, we would create the event on Alice's side with two uh, public keys encoded, so it would get signed by uh, Alice's key, but in this case Bob can also sign the event, so we, we entrust him to further propagate our changes and our event. In that case, Bob would be able to propagate the event and the changes to Eva, but Eva has no valid sig uh, signing key in order to sign the event and propagate it back, so Bob would always reject the changes. So this is what we call the protected mode. It's completely optional per event. You can, you can flip an event into protected mode or not. Super easy to do. Um, again, the only downside is you have to include the keys if you do. Now, finally, we also had a bunch of security fixes. So uh, as, as mentioned before, highly recommended that you always keep up to date and keep tracking the CVEs and the Twitter account that where we publish any new uh, vulnerabilities. We're in the very lucky position, and thanks all of you that have done so as well. Uh, we're getting a lot of penetration test results, so that means we're luckily in the, uh, in the security field, so all of our users can do this themselves. They have the capabilities, and they often do. So we get about a dozen uh, pen tests a year. Uh, in addition, we had a massive in-depth series uh, conducted by Zigrin Security on behalf of the Luxembourgish Army which was something like a full month of pen testing, so it was a pretty heavy one. Um, and that led to a lot of really interesting findings. So we ended up with 11 new CVs over the course of the last year, um, as well as a bunch of usability and bug fixes and so on that all came from the various reports that we've received. All of these are published on our website, so go to misproject slash security, misproject.org. Uh, slash security if you're interested in the individual CVEs. And again, we highly recommend that you update uh, whenever we release a security release. We usually make a lot of noise about it. So if you follow us on Twitter, you'll see that uh, that this was a security release, now is the time to update, then you probably should. So a little bit about the future. Uh, one of the main uh, tasks that we uh, have on our short-term uh, roadmap, so to say, is the uh, stack switch that I mentioned to Cerberus code base. Again, this is a parallel effort in many ways, so it's not going to be completely blocking uh, everything else that we do. We do it side by side with some other stuff, but this is an, one of the big overarching uh, tasks that we have. Now, on top of that, uh, you've seen some of the new systems, like the one that Sami was talking about with the workflows, the new correlation engine. A lot of these new systems that we have in place are basically uh, the starting stones for something much bigger. So we're, we still have a long way to go to really flesh out these functionalities. So from what Sai mentioned, add new hooks, for example, for the workflows, add additional correlation uh, engines that, for example, don't rely on the database, but rather uh, other data sources, uh, as well as much tighter integration with Cerebrate. And for example, for the cryptographic signing part, we want to go further and start signing sharing groups, for example, as well as encrypting data at rest in certain cases. 
So plenty to do for us uh, in, in those areas, as well as, uh, as with integrations. So we constantly get requests for different tools that people want to integrate with, so we're constantly working on those, as well as a lot of work around sticks and taxi in general. So there is quite a bit happening there, especially um, with the work that we do together with DHS uh, or with CISA and uh, with MITRE. Finally, uh, uh, something that, uh, that also kind of came out of, of this other project of Cerebrate th uh, that we're working on is we're building a, a pretty tight integration in Cerebrate's case with, uh, uh, with, with Keycloak in particular. But one of the things we want to do is we want to open MISP up as well to be uh, managed via an IEM system outside of MISP and to be able to push the entire user management out of the tool itself, at least on a voluntary basis. So if you want to switch to to running Keycloak as your user management system, you should be able to do that. So uh, again, the system is already in place for Cerebrate. The idea is to get this also for MISP so that we can manage uh, our users outside of, uh, of MISP. Now, apart from that, something that we are working on and we really want to get feedback on this, with the stack change, it is time to do some spring cleaning. So we want to throw out some functionalities that nobody uses. Uh, so some of the functionalities that have received absolutely no love over the past five, six years and are completely stale and not really usable anymore, we want to get rid of. Now, obviously, we'll get some voices that say, hey, wait, wait, I'm using that thing. <laughs> so we're interested in what sort of functionalities um, are not interesting for the community out there. We'll probably be running Twitter polls or something like that in the future just to gauge interest in certain functionalities that we think are not used by anyone anymore. So we really welcome any feedback on those. So to sum it all up, uh, we've had a pretty active year. Uh, so the community is growing incredibly rapidly. We're getting a lot of new work done by a lot of different parties. Uh, most of the focus of the past year was building on what we already have, so security, UX improvements, and so on, as well as, the, uh, as a lot of, of new work on things such as the workflow processes to be able to make MIS more customizable for the different users and different communities out there. Especially interesting because we're seeing so many, such a diverse community nowadays. Back, back in the day, it all started with just military and national C, uh, C certs. Nowadays, we have all sorts of users that are coming from completely different domains, not even cybersecurity in the first place. So, uh, so we're seeing a completely new uh, set of needs for these different communities. Now, with Cerebrate uh, as well, we want to move into a direction where we have a tool that manages multiple MISPs. We've been recommending using multiple MISPs for most organizations. I really like the first talk from Robert today, where he showed their very same example of having an external MISP uh, for collection and all those internal MISP uh, clusters that they showed. That is exactly what, what, what we also do ourselves and what we recommend to others. Now, in order to manage that, we really want to build on having a central tool per, per organization with Cerebrate that manages all of this for us. Again, prioritization is super hard. So we have our ideas of where we want to go. Sometimes those ideas are frankly dumb. So we really want to rely on you to give us feedback. What is it that you want to see changed? What doesn't work for you? Let us know so that we know which direction to go. And that's pretty much it. I have no idea how I was with time, but thanks all. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, now we have time for one or two questions. Is there a volunteer? Yeah. Hello. Um, in matter of um, improvements, there is plan for move to a graph database. A graph database. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get. There is a plan in the future to move to a graph database. Ah, graph database. Uh, no, not really. So uh, we we. We did explore that a while ago, whether it would make sense for us, but for most of our use cases, it doesn't. There are some parts of MISP where it might potentially make sense, uh, especially for the relationships, but that is a small part of what we do with MISP. Um, so we might end up in a situation in the future where we, for example, with the correlation engine, it might make sense to move the correlation engine in particular to a, a graph database, and that's what I meant, that the work is just starting there in terms of 
perhaps moving it to different databases and so on. So in those cases, it might make sense to have another database side by side with what we have now. We did that with Redis too, so we already have two databases in fact, with Redis and, and MariaDB uh, for MIST. So we might end up with, with that for correlations and for relationships, but not on the short term. So far, it's not a hurdle for us. Okay, thanks, clear enough. And also, I have read in the, in the repo, uh, there is plan to, um, to, to change the version of PHP uh, regarding the yes. uh, end of life. Yes. That's a big part of the stack change. So we're moving to cake PHP 4, which is uh, relying on PHP 8. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> One more question. Hello. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, what if I get the management crazy enough to run a MISP installation in the company? <laughs> Do you have some key takeaways or some heads up from that it does not get drowned in an idle process way environment, but reaches potential along the way? What are your, after you get this thing installed, what are the things that you recommend? Hey, this is going to be successful. Oh, that is, uh, yeah. I, I think that's a 50 minute talk in itself. Sorry. So, so, th so that's, that's a big topic. There are a lot of takeaways we have. We also have some documentation for some best practices. Uh, so that might make sense for you. It's, it is really tricky and it really depends on what you want to do with it. Um, so reach out to us. We can help you with that. We can walk you through some ideas and this is for everyone. Um, but. Depending on, on your use case, the, the recommendations will be very different. Some organizations use MISP as an internal tool, for example, to collect data from various d uh, data sources that they use to feed their automation tools. Some organizations run sharing communities, some do both. In all of these cases, the recommendations will be completely different in terms of how you want to set, set it up, how do you want to do patch management, and so on and so forth. Same with backups, same with, uh, uh, with the various different uh, protective measures. So we didn't talk about it, but I think as an example, Luciano will do a talk, to, a lightning talk tomorrow, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to talk about some of the extreme cases, what you can do um, if you want, uh, if you're in a more sensitive environment on how you can deal with data exchange there. So there are a lot of different nuances to this, but yeah, reach out to us and we can help you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Great. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. there. <laughs> yeah. So, don't hesitate to follow the Twitter account, GitHub, and so on, on, on for MISP and Celebrate Project. 